No son desvelo, me de no lo si du pu. Rosoli rones y posen totelos tofronos. In this video, we're going to talk about the public intellectualism of Athens in the 5th century BC. We're also starting here in the classical period, so little after 500 down to about 400 BC. In general, we're going to talk about why Athens in this century was the place to be for wisdom, for public intellectualism, for thinking and reflecting on the world and humanity in the world. We're going to focus more specifically in the first part of this study on the phenomenon of drama, on the birth of the stage play, tragedy and comedy alike. We'll try to set the scene by looking at the 6th century BC uh, development of lyric poetry, especially the notion of human vulnerability, what it's like to be interdependent in the way that human beings are, and in a way uh, to live a life where it seems like our fates are not entirely up to us. We'll look at how some of these notions help to lay the groundwork or uh, plant seeds in soil for the development of tragedy in 5th century Athens, especially the presentation of seemingly very difficult moral conundrums in tragedy, and how these in turn uh, set the scene for what's sometimes called the fragility of human goodness. This is the title for a 1986 book by the American philosopher Martha Nussbaum that we'll talk about quite a bit in this part of the lecture. Uh, in this book, Nussbaum lays out a notion of how philosophy responds to tragedy that's quite compelling and focuses on this theme in particular of what it is to be a good human being and the degree to which that's up to us. After that first part of our exploration, in the next video after this one, we'll look at another major movement of public intellectualism in 5th century Athens. That's what's sometimes called the Sophistic Movement. After the Sophists, a label given by others usually uh, to public intellectuals in Athens. Some of the key figures in the movement include Protagoras, Gorgias, and perhaps Aspasia and Socrates as well. It's important to stress, though, that the category or the name of sophist, again, is applied by others, uh, particularly by philosophers or people identifying as philosophers in the later 5th and early 4th century BC, especially by Plato. And Plato, as a pupil of Socrates, is particularly concerned to show that Socrates is anything but a sophist. So the very notion of the sophist, in a way, serves as a counterpoint to the notion of the philosopher, which, as we'll see, is going to be developed and explored in distinction, both to tragedy on the one hand and to sophistry on the other. So one way to start on these themes is to spend a little bit of time thinking about the famous Athenian metaphor and image of the owl. This is uh, graffiti from the city center in modern Athens, and it represents the owl as emblematic of Athens. This particular work of art was inspired by Jimi Hendrix's lyric, knowledge speaks, but wisdom listens. The owl in antiquity was emblematic of Athens. Uh, owls literally roosted in the Parthenon of Athena and were symbolic of wisdom, including the wisdom of the city. You can see here charmingly an image of Athena with her helmet and spear with the owl of wisdom right next to her. The owls also appeared on Athenian coins, and in a way this picks up an important theme in Athens. Both literally and in the coinage, owls were so common that bringing owls to Athens became emblematic of something superfluous. Uh, in another version of the saying, like bringing coal to Newcastle, bringing to a place something there's already plenty of there. But metaphorically, the owls can stand for wisdom. There's lots of thoughtfulness in Athens or lots of intellectuals in Athens. Why bring more? That's going to be an interesting theme when we think about how the sophists arrived. And secondly, as another aspect of the question, uh, owls could stand for the coins, literally for money in Athens. So why bring more money to a city that's already wealthy in antiquity? So in the theme of this lecture, in the fifth century, wisdom came to Athens like owls to Athens with the sophists and met the local owls there. So starting out with a little bit of historical background, we're talking about uh, the city of Athens in the Greek mainland. And in the map of places we've looked at so far, that means we're going to set aside some of the different places we've been, but bear them in mind, because people will be coming from all over those familiar parts of the Greek world, 
to visit Athens in our century. And part of the backstory is the enormous range of naval prowess and travel that becomes centered on Athens as an economic and political power in this period. Athens experienced a lot of prosperity and political significance after her leadership and victories in the Greco-Persian Wars early in the 5th century BC. And this was also aided by the discovery of a huge seam of silver in the Athenian mines located at Laurium in 483. So some of those coins we've been looking at, the Athenian owls in another sense, can be seen here. On the advice of the statesman Themistocles, the Athenians decided to build a fleet of 200 triremes. That was the wooden wall prophesied by the oracle at Delphi uh, to help fend off the Persian invasion early in the 5th century. These triremes also became the basis of a major naval power in Athens, really an imperial power in all but name that was rooted in the Delian League, of 150 and then later up to 330 Greek city-states that were allied from the year 478 onward. Athens had undergone uh, major steps of democratization based, as you'll remember from our discussion in the Palace to Polis series, on the 6th century reforms of Solon and Cleisthenes. Here on the screen you can see what remains of the Pnyx, of the Democratic Assembly and the Speaker's Podium there. Major policy in Athens was consistently decided by the assembly or ecclesia of all free male citizens over 20, regardless of their family, background, or wealth. However, it's important to stress that even though a kind of underlying value for equality under the law was explicit, many people were still disenfranchised, including all the women of Athens, the slaves, and medics who were resident foreigners in the city. Some philosophers in Athens, especially in the Platonic and Stoic traditions, would later question that, whether isonomia or equality under the law needed to apply much more broadly. For example, arguments in Plato's Republican laws stress the importance of gender equality in government and in education. Uh, Zeno of Citium and other Stoic philosophers would argue that human slavery is unnatural, according to a common interpretation of Diogenes Laertius. And uh, Stoics would also argue that all human beings constitute a kind of universal community or cosmopolis. A lot of the political developments, though, taking ourselves back to the 5th century, had to do with the impetus and the inspiration of a charismatic statesman named Pericles. Athens reached the height of her power under Pericles, who was both a general or military strategist and a very effective orator. And he was concerned to promote the arts and literature and major building programs like the new Parthenon on the Acropolis. He also sponsored important public intellectuals like Anaxagoras of Clazomeni and Aspasia of Miletus, who, partly because of their association with Pericles, became a target of substantial hostility later. So if we think a little bit about the kinds of arts that were sponsored in Athens, there's quite a broad range. Uh, already a century earlier, Pisistratus the tyrant had commissioned some of the first permanent texts of Homer, maybe the first ever, in Athens, and competitions of poetic rhapsodes continued in Athens' Panathenaic festival all through the 5th century, as we know from authors like Plato. In addition, uh, Athens was seen, uh, at least by Athenians, as the birthplace of the best in tragedy and comedy, rooted in choral rites that honored Dionysus, or the drama. And it seems true that visitors from all over the Mediterranean world came to see Athenian drama during the festival of the Dionysia in honor of Dionysus each year. In addition, uh, rhetoric was a big deal. Virtuosic rhetoricians, orators, politicians would come to Athens to apply their expertise in verbal persuasion, practiced before the assembly and the courts. This kind of makes sense if you think that Athens is a sort of important proto-democratic state where major policy decisions can be made by referendum on the spot, by a large assembly. So one charismatic speaker who can move the whole assembly quickly can steer the ship of state, sometimes not for the best, as we can see from Athens' quick reversals of decisions made because of this sort of apparently uh, very charismatic and persuasive testimony to the assembly. Part of the success of the people who came to be called sophists was that wealthy young Athenians would see their ability to persuade crowds and invest huge amounts of money in rhetorical education to learn to do that too. This led to quite a bit of suspicion of the visiting orators 
partly with this title of sophist, because they were perceived to advocate for a kind of moral relativism, a rejection of what the Athenians saw as traditional values, and for this idea that in a way, there's no real truth besides persuasion. This also touched on some of the themes of natural philosophy that we've been studying in our conversations over the last few weeks. So many of the so-called sophists or public intellectuals shared an interest in the new methods and subjects of research and argument that had been developed by thinkers like the Milesians, uh, some of those pre-Socratic thinkers that we've been talking about recently from places like Ionia or Sicily. So in addition to the poetry, the drama and the rhetoric, uh, to some degree, sophists in particular, brought something of these new ways of thinking and new subjects of interest to Athens. So let's think a little bit now about drama in Athens and its influence on culture and thought. Um, to give a bit of background to this, before we talk about tragedy and comedy, it might be helpful to reflect back on the preceding century and the developments of lyric poetry in particular, which we've talked about a little bit before when we thought about myth and the hero, especially the so-called polis hero, not in the proper Greek sense of a hero who receives cult or worship, but a good person or an excellent human being, and the poet's aspirations to frame what that person would be like. You might remember this passage from Pindar, the lyric poet of the sixth century, creatures of the passing day. What is anyone? What is anyone not? A man is a shadow's dream, but when the radiance given of Zeus comes, there's a bright light upon men and life is sweet. And this in a way can be read as, as having to do with immortality. Human beings are limited in time, but it's possible for us to achieve greatness and in a way achieve everlasting memory. In addition, how do we achieve that kind of excellence, that kind of everlasting memory for the lyric poet? Another perspective comes from both Pindar and Simonides, his near contemporary. I praise and embrace anyone, says Simonides, who wants to do nothing ugly, nothing base. A person who's not too helpless suffices for me, someone who knows the justice that benefits the community or polis. Putting these together, at least one way of reading some of uh, the morality in lyric poetry is that somebody who's prepared to help the community is somebody who can achieve renown, somebody who can achieve a kind of immortality or the radiance given of Zeus. This comes out quite eloquently in another poem of Pindar's. Some people pray for gold, others for limitless lands, but I pray to please my fellow citizens and then to cover my limbs in earth, having praised the praiseworthy and scattered reproof on the wicked. Excellence soars upward like a tree fed on fresh dews, lifted among the wise and just toward the liquid upper air. The need for friends comes in many forms. It's most valued in times of trouble, true, but joy too craves to look upon trusty support. This idea of excellence or arete, what it is to be a good person, is situated here in a metaphor like a tree. We need soil, we need water, we need community and friendship around us in order to, to succeed, to, to be human well. This also kind of ties into the idea that the radiance of Zeus is not only a matter of what we might consider uh, the project of the Homeric hero, the Kalos Kegathos, who individually achieves Kleos, glory and honor, and a kind of immortality through their extraordinary achievements. Here, it's through cooperation. It's through working together, through friendship, and uh, through doing what's right for the polis, that the individual can become truly great. There's also, if we sort of pick up the theme of vulnerability almost, of sharing society, of working together. Another angle from the lyric poetry of the 6th century BC that's interesting, which is love. Poets, uh, not only like Pindar and Simonides, but also like Sappho, write very eloquently about the power of love and the vulnerability of an individual human being in love. This passage from Sappho is very famous. Some say an army of horsemen, some of foot soldiers, some of ships is the most beautiful thing on the black earth but I say it's what one loves. That man to me seems equal to the gods, she sings, the man who sits opposite you, the beloved, and close by your sweet voice. When I look at you, I can't speak. I can't even see. I'm trembling like the green grass. I tell you, someone will remember us in the future. 
So here's another perspective on the juxtaposition of human vulnerability, like the tree that needs soil, company, and community. So too an individual human being is vulnerable, but in some ways in that very vulnerability of love, we can be remembered. There's an immortality in love. So if we put some of these themes together, we come to one of the points that's been made very eloquently by Martha Nussbaum in The Fragility of Goodness, right at the outset. Human beings are vulnerable. We are in some way uh, responsible to our communities, but we also are held accountable for what we achieve as individuals. How do these work together? If for me to be happy, to flourish, to succeed, I'm like a plant in need of watering and it's not all up to me. How can I also be uh, responsible for my own excellence, arete or achievement? You could think of this sort of like, how does the Homeric hero's ideals line up with the, the polis poet, the lyric ideals? How can we be both vulnerable and individually responsible? So it, as Nussbaum puts this very eloquently too, we need to be born with adequate capacities to live in fostering natural and social circumstances, to stay clear of abrupt catastrophe, to develop confirming associations with other human beings. We can't just go it alone. And also picking up the theme from Sappho in the last slides, the tenderness of a plant is not the dazzling hardness of a gem. Perhaps part of the peculiar beauty of human excellence just is its vulnerability. That's part of what it is to be human, to flourish as a human being, like a plant. So that in a way, as a background, lyric poetry sets us up to think a bit more about human vulnerability and the juxtaposition of our reliance on others, that we can't go it alone, that we're vulnerable to all kinds of experiences in the world on the one hand, with the, the quest for excellence, for flourishing, and the sense of individual responsibility. And this brings us to drama in the fifth century BC. Aristotle tells a story in the Poetics about how drama begins. The place where it begins is right here, the theater of Dionysus in Athens, not necessarily where the very first proto-dramatic choral performances were held, but certainly the place really associated in popular imagination already then in antiquity with the origins of theater. Aristotle argues that human beings naturally delight in imitation or mimesis. We're just beings who by nature like to imitate in all kinds of media, color, form, dance, rhythm, and harmony. What we usually call poetry in Greek poiesis, uh, which literally means creation, just evolves naturally from imitation. It's a kind of imitation, which we do again, just cataphusin by nature. And its meters, scales, melodies, and rhythms reflect the characters of the poets and the subjects that they're talking about. Early poetry, as a kind of ancestor of what later would become drama, was a sacred song offered by a citizen chorus, literally a dance, in honor of the god Dionysus. And in fact, another dramatist, Aristophanes the Comedian, tells us that choral song was part of the ancient Paideia, the old education of Athenian youths. According to Aristotle, a poet called Thespis of Athens in the sixth century introduced opposite that chorus of citizens, an actor in a mask. And this was the first actor. In fact, on one story, Thespis himself was this first actor, hence our name Thespian in English for actors. And the actor had not only the sung part, but also dialogue, a spoken part and an acted part. So the actor would act out what was going on. Hence, this was drama, which in Greek is literally action or doing. By the way, Solon, the lawgiver, was apparently not impressed with the first play, so he became the first drama critic. That's a story uh, we get from Plutarch's life of Solon. So at that point, we have one chorus and one actor. But Aeschylus, uh, in the uh, next century, added a second actor, according to Aristotle, and really put an emphasis on dialogue in addition to song. A little bit later, Sophocles uh, would add a third actor and what was called the skene or the scene building. So scenery around the actors. So we're getting something more recognizably like our notion of drama. So according to Aristotle, this was how tragedy and comedy both got started. Uh, they were stage plays that reflected and developed the natural imitative urge of human beings through poetry and melody, 
with the background of these choral songs of citizen choruses, adding actors individually and eventually adding multiple actors and a skene. Uh, now there were these two different mediums, tragedy, which literally in Greek is tragodia, a goat song, that arose from imitation with magnitude and dignity, and its subjects are greater than life, more noble, more dignified. Comedy, a rebel song or commodia, arose from the imitation of what's worse than the ordinary, smaller than life. Uh, so this is an important distinction. It's not about tragedy being sad and comedy being happy. It's about tragedy being big and comedy smaller. At least that's the Aristotelian model. And both kinds of plays were performed in the theater of Dionysus. To give a few examples of what we're talking about, these are some of the famous uh, dramatic and tragic stories. Oedipus the King uh, by Sophocles. Oedipus tries to avoid a terrible oracle that he will kill his father and marry his mother, but unwittingly he brings that very prophecy to pass and in the process gains self-knowledge, discovers the true meaning of his name and his life. Another play by Aeschylus a little earlier, Agamemnon. The Greek king Agamemnon is forced to choose between the life of his daughter, Iphigenia, and the salvation of the entire Greek fleet. In some versions of this story, the goddess Artemis had demanded the sacrifice of Iphigenia to make up for an error on the Greeks' part, but then rescues Iphigenia, maybe in secret, maybe openly, by substituting a deer or goats. In other versions, Iphigenia is in fact slain. In this play, Agamemnon's wife Clytemnestra, with her lover Aegisthus, plans his death, and this sets in, uh, in action a chain of events, including a sort of proto-Hamlet story, where Agamemnon's son Orestes attempts to take vengeance. Uh, that story is played out in the rest of a trilogy by Aeschylus. For example, Orestes is instructed by Apollo at Delphi to avenge his father's murder by slaying his own mother. He's driven to go through with it, but is then pursued by the Furies for his blood guilt until Athena reconciles the old or Chthonic gods with the Olympian gods in the first court of law in Athens. Not all tragedies have to be uh, uh, stories with a sad ending. The uh, Alcestis, for example, represents a heroic woman who has agreed to die to spare her husband's life. But when she does die, Heracles happens to arrive at that moment in a good serendipity, wrestles death, and uh, won't let death go until Alcestis' life is spared. And so this play, in a way, has a happy ending. So that's a little bit of uh, some examples of, of major Greek tragedies. Aristotle, again, in the Poetics, is trying to explain them and understand them. He says there's six elements in a tragedy. Uh, again, remembering we're talking about these poetic imitations, how they begin. The most important, he says, is the plot, what he describes as the incidents of the story in combination. Tragedy, he says, is essentially an imitation, not of persons, but of action or life. So plot trumps character in an interesting way. Uh, in a play, they don't act in order to portray the characters, he suggests. They include the characters for the sake of the action. The story's the thing. So that it's the action in it, the plot, that is the goal. Telos, very important word for Aristotle, the goal of things, the purpose of the tragedy. And the goal is everywhere the main thing. That's from Poetic Six. He also reflects a bit on the, the function of tragedy and drama for human beings. Again, a tragedy is a special kind of imitation of a big, dignified and noble action uh, in language with pleasurable accessories, with incidents arousing pity and fear in order to accomplish its catharsis of emotions like that. This is one of the passages most talked about in Aristotle. We wonder what a catharsis is. It's literally like a washing out. So to wash out pity and fear to get emotions out in the open, maybe? There have been lots of interpretations that we'll look at in a moment. Uh, in addition, he stresses again that tragedy is about imitating what's better than the ordinary, not what's smaller than life. It's like a portrait painter or a sculptor who is representing their subject, but representing them at their very best. So that's a tragodia, that's a goat song in the Greek sense. So there's two aspects of tragedy I'd like to pick out here to frame our thoughts about early philosophy in Athens. Uh, 
One is this idea of the catharsis of emotions, including pity and fear, a washing out or release, however we understand it, and it's, it's much debated today. Of course, one of the most famous 20th, 20th century interpretations uh, was Freud's, that a catharsis in Aristotle's sense in tragedy meant the process of reducing a complex uh, that had been repressed by recalling it to conscious awareness and allowing it to be expressed. But modern, both scholarly and psychological perspectives vary greatly from that. The other uh, aspect or area of focus I want to try to tease out is how tragedy presents moral challenges or dilemmas that invite the viewer to recognize them, maybe to get this sort of catharsis of feeling. Here is Oedipus. We see how he got there almost by mistake, and he's stuck there, and we feel pity and fear for him. We also recognize how terrible the situation is. There's no solution. We just recognize it. So sometimes then it might be impossible, the thought goes, and one interpretation, uh, to be a good person. Uh, sometimes if plot trumps character in this sense, the story, the action, might simply mean that it's very difficult for Oedipus to do anything different. And this presents a real challenge later for philosophy. And just to, to bring this out a little bit more, we can see again how Nussbaum and other uh, modern thinkers have tried to make sense of this aspect of tragedy. The tragedies show us and dwell on tragic conflict, an intractable sort of case. In cases like this, we see a wrong action committed without any direct physical compulsion and in full knowledge of its nature by a person whose ethical character or commitments would otherwise dispose him to reject the act. The constraint comes from the presence of circumstances that prevent the adequate fulfillment of two valid ethical claims. So there's a kind of moral conundrum that seems very hard to solve, maybe impossible. What can we do? Well, we can certainly feel, we can express this, uh, these emotions, if that's the right way of understanding what Aristotle has to say about catharsis, but is there anything else we can do? As Nussbaum stresses too, uh, Aeschylus, as a playwright of plays like the Agamemnon, doesn't exactly show us a solution, that's not the goal, but shows us the depth of the moral conundrum itself, uh, which he does brilliantly. Uh, so this, this kind of encouragement of catharsis is an extraordinary work of art. The best the agent in the story can do, as Nussbaum goes on, is to have their suffering, this kind of natural expression of their goodness of character, their character is not lost, they are who they are still, and not to stifle these responses out of misguided optimism. We, who identify in a way with the chorus, who are reflecting on the big picture of the events, the best we can do is to respect the gravity of the predicament, respect the responses that express that person's goodness, even in a seemingly impossible situation, and think about their case as showing a possibility for human life in general. Or at least that's a way of understanding this aspect of tragedy. So this possibility of, in a way, the fragility of our goodness, pulling back for a minute to this perspective in lyric poetry, the sense that uh, we, we rely on the world around us, we're like uh, trees, plants in need of watering. And then in the context of tragedy too, that that vulnerability means in part, or is maybe related in part with our very humanity and the fact that sometimes we're in these very difficult moral conundrums or situations where we can just express our goodness if we're uh, to conceive of ourselves like a character in a tragedy and recognize the situation. Well, this invites a response later. Uh, and this is in a way a preview of some of the ideas that we'll see in a few decades in the following conversations about philosophy. So pulling back again to the sixth century, to Pindar and to lyric poetry, and that idea of this sort of uh, human uh, openness and vulnerability, which as we've seen is really important as part of being human. There's a consolation, Nussbaum suggests, that so far Pindar has apparently left something out. However much human beings resemble lower forms of life, we are unlike. We want to insist in one crucial respect. As uh, some philosophers like Aristotle might stress, this is a very human perspective, the lower forms of life. Uh, it's us who want to insist that we're distinct. In any case, here we are. We have reason. We are able to deliberate, to choose, 
to make a plan in which ends are ranked, to decide actively what is to have value and how much. And all this must count for something. If it's true that a lot about us is messy, needy, uncontrolled, rooted in the dirt, standing helplessly in the rain. It is also true that there is something about us that is pure and purely active, something that we could think of as, a quote from Plato's Fido here, divine, immortal, intelligible, unitary, indissoluble, ever self-consistent, invariable. It seems possible that this rational element in us can rule and guide the rest, thereby saving the whole person from living at the mercy of luck. Now, this treatment really puts the emphasis on the idea that there is such a thing as this kind of capacity for reason and reflection that has a unique role in human decision making. Uh, and it might be something that is not vulnerable in the same way that the rest of human motivation seems to be. I'm not sure that this is the view that Plato himself will later take, at least not in quite this way. So, for example, in Plato's Republic in Book 4, as we'll see, there's an emphasis not on reason necessarily as the ruler of human motivation, but as able to create a harmony of many different human motivations, including emotion and embodied needs. Uh, we also see that in Plato, there's an important emphasis on inspiration, on uh, forms of knowledge and motivation beyond reason. But leaving that to the side for now, the real emphasis here is on whether there are conundrums, situations, and dilemmas that cannot be resolved. And a way this is expressed in uh, some of the Platonic dialogues is as a case where fundamental divine commitments seem to be in conflict. For example, in Aeschylus, in the uh, Eumenides, where we seem to see a conflict between the instructions of Apollo through the Delphic Oracle and the, the basic needs of the Furies. These are different divine commitments that seem to come into conflict. Or again with Agamemnon, who seems to face contradictory divine injunctions from the inspiration of the gods. Socrates is portrayed in Plato as challenging stories like that. He suggests, at least this is one way of reading the Platonic dialogue, the Euthyphro, that it's not necessarily true that gods ever do disagree in this way. And while that might seem like a statement about myth, questioning whether mythic accounts are true, it's also more than that. It's questioning whether fundamental moral values of the kind that are expressed by the gods are ever actually in conflict. So it might seem pretty natural that the demands of love and war represented by Aphrodite and Ares, or let's say the demands of ecstasy with Dionysus and reason, cultural memory and the arts with Apollo, it might seem reasonable to think that, that some of these are opposed to one another. But on the view that Socrates expresses on this interpretation, they might actually be expressive of a deeper harmony. And it would be the work of the philosopher to try to find that single harmony, uh, so far as possible that the, uh, the many different divine dimensions can express. This is in a way intrinsic in the notion of harmony or harmonia, which suggests a multiplicity in concord. And that's the very word that Plato will use in the passage I mentioned a moment ago from Republic Four. The many motivations of our psyche as well might need not to be uh, dominated or eliminated even through catharsis, but rather tuned into harmony so that they all work together, uh, the justice of the many citizens of an inner city. Now, we sometimes encounter strong versions of this idea that tragedy and philosophy are basically opposed because philosophy seeks to, to valorize the uh, non-vulnerability of reason. Uh, a good example is Bernard Williams' uh, famous uh, discussion of philosophy that Nussbaum also quotes, uh, the idea that tragedy really brings out our exposure to fortune, the insecurity of human happiness, uh, and in a way the recognition that um, we, should, we should almost celebrate or at least be aware of this kind of vulnerability. In contrast to how Greek philosophy, in now quoting from the end of the quote on screen, uh, in its sustained pursuit of rational self-sufficiency, does turn its back on kinds of human experience and human necessity, of which Greek literature itself offers the purest, if not the richest, expression. 
But Nussbaum also helps to kind of moderate that understanding. So the continuity between Greek tragedy, she suggests in response to Williams, and Greek philosophy is quite a bit greater. Inside tragedy itself, she stresses, we find arresting portrayals of the human ambition to rational self-sufficiency, to really understand ourselves and act accordingly. We come to understand the ways in which problems of exposure, that is to fortune, motivate this ambition. On the other hand, Plato's philosophical search for a self-sufficient good life is motivated by a keen sense of these same problems. Far from having forgotten about what tragedy describes, he sees the problems of exposure so clearly that only a radical solution seems adequate to their depth, nor is he naive about the costs of the solution. So this is in a way to get ahead of ourselves because it's going to be a little while before we really think deeply about Socrates and Plato's dialogues and how they develop the notion of philosophy itself. That's yet to come. But it's an interesting way of looking at the background uh, in a really well-known art form in the period that Socrates and Plato both live uh, and uh, try to do their work. Tragedy is a way of understanding the human condition, experience, and how we should live that they both are interested in responding to. And uh, there's a few of these aspects of tragedy, again, that we can consider as we juxtapose tragedy and philosophy. Uh, so thinking of it more like a dialogue, there is this suggestion that philosophy emphasizes reason rather than emotion, maybe with a distrust of the process that Aristotle calls catharsis. That might be true, but it's also more complex, especially for Plato. So, for example, again, in Plato's Republic IV, uh, this notion that we're looking for a kind of harmony or tuning of the motivational streams in us, like a just city of uh, citizens working well together. It's possible that this is an approach that Plato develops later in life, uh, which could also be a way of understanding philosophical development on this question. There's also this question of whether uh, philosophers deny, at least in this Socratic tradition, the existence of fundamentally conflicting values. Uh, so this comes out in the insistence by Socrates as he's portrayed by Plato in dialogues like the Euthyphro, that the fundamental values that the gods represent while they might well be deeply plural, are still reconcilable. Like a musical instrument or a lyre, many strings, many notes, but in harmonia or well-tuned. This comes out really vividly in the passage I've referred to several times, so I might as well share it in full. This is from Republic 4 by Plato, uh, 443 C to E. He's talking about justice and justice being really good for us. Justice, as Socrates says here in the dialogue, isn't concerned with doing our own work on the outside, but with what's inside, with what's truly ourselves and our own. The just person puts herself in order as her own friend and harmonizes the three parts of herself, that is, logos or reason, thumos or emotion and social status, uh, epithumia, appetite and need, like three limiting notes in a musical scale, high, low and middle. She binds together those parts and any others there may be in between, and from having been many things, she becomes entirely one, moderate and harmonious. Only then does she act. And when she does anything, whether it's acquiring wealth, taking care of her body, engaging in politics, private business, in all of these, she believes that that action is just and fine, that preserves this inner harmony and helps to achieve it, and calls it so, and regards as wisdom the knowledge that oversees actions like that. So here we have this beautiful image of harmony, the harmony of human motivation as a whole. And that's the philosopher's aspiration to wisdom. In a way, we've gotten ahead of ourselves again. So let's just review where we've been. We've set the scene for Athens in the 5th century BC, uh, its social, economic, and intellectual soil, and how in that soil drama springs up, including tragedy and comedy, as at least in Aristotle's view, an exercise of imitation. We've looked at lyric poetry as an important background to these developments, and particularly to the kinds of moral conundrums of the fragility of goodness that philosophers like Martha Nussbaum and Bernard Williams have drawn our attention to. And finally, we've thought a little bit about how uh, there's a search for the harmony of fundamental values in philosophy that is in a way allied with the project of tragedy and drama more deeply. And this sets a scene for the next part of our conversation. Now that we've thought a bit about how philosophers seek to answer the tragic question, 
Is it always possible to be good? We can also turn to how philosophers seek to understand another major movement in 5th century Athens, that of the Sophists. Uh, again, some of the key figures we'll be talking about include Protagoras and Gorgias, and then Aspasia and Socrates, some of whom uh, later figures are at pains to focus on as not at all sophists, as almost the opposite of sophists, and how philosophy itself develops and is articulated in response to this image. So that's coming up next. No Sonsespero